Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. As ever, I'm bringing you such an exciting guest tonight. Welcome, Richard Newman. Thanks so much, Jane. Good to have <laughs> good, good to be on your show. So, Richard is the founder of Body Talk, a corporate communications training company that helps businesses find their voice and win the projects and deals they deserve. In one instance, uh, Body Talk's intervention resulted in a billion pounds worth of new business for a leading UK construction company. So he is really quite a powerhouse in this area. And today, what we're going to focus on is the importance of nonverbal communication, that's body language to most of us, and the role that it plays in success. So great to have you here, Richard. Now, you're a podcaster as well. Before we get into it, would you like to tell us about your podcast as well? Sure. Th thanks, Jane. Yeah. So we have uh, the Body Talk show, which uh, I hosted for, for a long time. And now my colleague, uh, Alina Jenkins, who has spent many years on the BBC, on TV and radio, she's now our host. And we have great guests on there all about communication. Amazing. Such an important topic. Obviously, one of my favorite topics, communication and connection. I just love it. OK, so we're going to focus on this one particular area of communication today, which is which is the nonverbal stuff. There's a body language. And I've got lots of questions, lots of thoughts kind of churning in my head that I'd like to ask you. But the first one is, do you think in the era of online communications that body language and nonverbal communication has become more or less important? Yeah, great question. So I think it's become more important for two very important reasons. So for a few years, people have been saying to me, maybe for the last 10 years, people have said to me, uh, do you think that communication and body language is going to become less important as we go more into a digital age mm -hmm. and so on? And I've said, no, 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 it's going to become much, much more important because we've got a whole generation of people now who are so used to looking at their screen and less used to looking at another person and connecting with somebody. And so therefore, the need for b people being trained in that area is significant higher. And then when you think about how people are now communicating, uh, if you think about the number of times that pre-pandemic, back in 2018, 2019, how many times you might have a conversation with somebody on the phone? Uh, for me, certainly in many of my clients, the vast majority of those phone calls that used to be just voice now have video included. Yes. And so we are presenting ourselves on screen all day, every day. Uh, so uh, the, the era of, you know, just needing to have a decent tone of voice is over. We now need to make sure that our body language and our ability around sort of media training as well, being able to present ourselves well with lights, camera and a microphone is that much higher. The other piece that's important with this, too, is that if you imagine going to a boardroom meeting four or five years ago, you could sit at the back of the boardroom. You'd be maybe seven or eight meters away from your boss. And so the impact you're having there is not as significant. Whereas now, if you have a meeting with your boss, you're not even one meter away. No matter how far away you are at the back of the room, if you like, you're still right there in front of them. And they can see every flicker that's happening on your face, uh, every inhale, exhale. So your ability to put across the right uh, message, whether you're in the team or you are leading the team, is that much more important. Yeah, I, it's such an interesting topic, isn't it? Because sometimes I watch TV programs that analyze or I watch things on YouTube that analyze uh, people's body language. And they say, particularly like criminals, you're looking at them and you're saying, you know what, that little kind of you move, that shoulder movement proves that he's lying and things like <laughs> that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. So it, it's it's such a kind of interesting and fun topic. So do you think we are in control of our body language or do you think our, you know, the nonverbal communication actually is the is the key to what's really going on in our minds and that we can't actually control it? Yeah, this is a really important piece for people to get right, because sometimes I've heard people mistakenly say, oh, body language is just a bit like nail varnish. It's just a bit of polish on top of things. It doesn't really mean anything. But actually, it's so much more profoundly important in the way that we connect with other human beings where words really are the, the surface layer and the the nonverbal part is sharing so much underneath it so i mean anyone can see this very simply if you get a text message 
very often you might find that you feel confused by what it says. Is the person happy? Are they sad? Why do they put that in all caps? Is, because, is that because they're angry or because they're really elated? You don't know. If yeah. you get them on the phone, suddenly the tone of voice helps you. But when you see them, you suddenly get the full picture of what's really going on. And so, you know, I had a great experience of this back in, uh, when was it? 1995. I had just left school and I went off to live in the foothills of the Himalayas where I was living in a little Tibetan monastery. And I was teaching English to these Tibetan monks who didn't speak a word of English. They spoke just uh, Tibetan, Nepali and Hindi. And so we had no language to connect with at all. And yet when I first arrived there, they sat me down in their kitchen and they gave me a, a little cup of Tibetan tea, which is a tea mixed with butter and salt. So it's quite horrific to uh, start to try this. <laughs> and I was sitting there thinking, God, this is awful. And looking at them thinking, we have no language to connect with. How are we going to do this? And over the space of maybe half an hour to an hour, we started to realize that through our body language, we understood each other incredibly well. Mm. And uh, I, I then lived with them for six months and was able to use my body language to help them have good conversational English. And uh, I, I left there you know, profoundly moved by the power of using body language to connect uh, with someone before then going and studying acting for a few years and understanding the nonverbal side of bringing a story to life. So that there is so much that you can do nonverbally to connect with people without words even needing to be exchanged and not to dismiss words. Uh, you know, I, I am an author. <laughs> I'm a, I've been a speech writer in the past. So I really love the power of words, but you have to understand that, you know, you can have a brilliant speech delivered that doesn't engage anybody because the delivery was off. Whereas, you know, you could take somebody who's fantastic at delivering information, who could read the back of a cornflakes packet and just read the ingredients and be utterly engaging. So, of course, the, the, the ultimate way to communicate is to put those two elements together, have great words matched by great nonverbal delivery, and suddenly you're utterly compelling. And, you know, my goal with my clients is to help them do those two things. Yeah, well, I have to say, Richard, you're doing a fantastic uh, show there in terms of all the hand movements and keeping everything kind of going in a very animated way. Now, you mentioned that you were an actor or that you had an acting background. Um, I did a drama and English degree as well, so I did a little bit of acting, but I was never an actor. That was not really my thing. But some people might be looking at this and looking at you and thinking, well, it's all right for him. He's a professional actor. I mean, how important is it to have those have those skills and be able to project yourself into a role, as it were? Or yeah. would you say that doesn't really matter? Anybody can do it. Yeah. So, so a few thoughts around this, uh, because sometimes I've trained people over the last uh, couple of decades that my company has been going, where sometimes people have walked into the room and said, oh, you, you can't teach this stuff. You can either communicate or, or you can't. Mm. And so uh, you know, I've opened up to people to say, look, when I was a child, I was described as very shy. I am very introvert. So there's there's you know a real scale of between introvert and extrovert. And I'm 99% uh, introvert. Ooh. And I've also recently been diagnosed autistic. So you know communication is not something that came easily to me. This is something I really had to work at. And uh, you know, in my early years of uh, just before I set up my business, I was reading dozens and dozens of books on communication in every area, just trying to figure out how this stuff works. So no matter what situation you're, you're in, whether you feel that communication is easy or natural for you, then uh, you you absolutely can work on this. And so it, it's critical, I think, that people don't think of this as sort of soft skills or a nice to have, but realize your ability to connect with other people, your ability to have a deeper connection, a stronger relationship, a greater state of influence with your family and your friends, your community and your company is pivotal to what you're able to achieve in life. And you absolutely can go from wherever you are right now to be a really accomplished uh, communicator by studying and understanding key areas uh, that can make all the difference. And that's what I've been dedicated to for so many years is to figure out, is there something that every single person can do that transforms their ability to communicate? And this has been important for my business because we train people all the way around Europe. We go into the Middle East, Asia, America, Africa, Australia. And so we need to figure out, you know, even though there are cultural differences, is there 
a universal way of improving communication for people when we're training corporations that have you know global offices. So, so that's all critical. And then coming back to part of your question, which I find uh, fascinating too. I've got two uh, young children. They're 11 and eight at the moment. And uh, I've encouraged them to go and have uh, acting classes on the weekends which they're absolutely loving. And I would encourage you know, every parent to give this gift to their children where I'm not suggesting for a moment that they sort of go off and become professional actors, but the ability to understand how to bring a story to life, how to connect with somebody else is so pivotal in your life that you know, whatever age you are, I'd encourage people to think, if you want to get started somewhere, the simple way to do it is go and do an acting class or an improv class or something that, that means you need to connect with someone and you need to bring a story to life which is a skill that you're going to need every day in business. Yeah, a really, really important point. One of the things that I found fascinating that you talked about, Richard, was also this uh, recent diagnosis of autism because people have this idea that autistic people are terrible communicators because they can't read the signals from others. They can't actually interpret any of those nonverbal signals. I mean, let alone the verbal ones. So... Uh, mm. you know, is that something that I, I'm just really curious to know whether that is something that in you has made you so passionate to really become an expert in this area or whether it, it really mm. had nothing to do with the, you know, the business that you've grown and uh, the profession that you have now? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've decided to essentially scratch my own itch as so many uh, you know, business leaders and entrepreneurs end up doing. They build something because they're so fascinated with it. And, and I realized from the age of about four years old that uh, I was struggling to connect with other people and just didn't know why. So I have a vivid memory of when I was four, just turning five years old, that I, I moved schools, went, moved, we moved to this new area. And uh, I was there then I you know, went in to, to meet uh, the, the children in this class and I tried to connect with people and just didn't understand why it was that the people were ignoring me, turning their back on me. I couldn't seem to make a, a contact or engagement with anybody and did what any child might do at that age and just sort of burst into tears. And the, the teacher was trying <laughs> to comfort me. But I remember thinking, hmm, everyone else seems to know how to have a conversation and I can't seem to do that. I'm going to need to work on this. And it was years later when I was 16, for my 16th birthday, a friend of mine bought me this book called Body Language by Alan Pease, which was like the original um, work that popularized the term body language. And I read it totally fascinated. I was thumbing down all the pages, like making notes, rereading it over and over again. And it suddenly became like the holy grail of communication for me. And then I realized there were so many other books in the area, like uh, Desmond Morris's um, epic book, People Watching. And yeah. then, you know, all the other pieces that people can look at for, uh, you know, lie detection. And you mentioned earlier, like TV shows where they talk about lie detection. I was privileged enough to meet and interview Paul Ekman, who uh, there was a TV show called Lie to Me that came out a few years ago with Tim Roth in it. And it was based on Paul Ekman's work where he's the person who managed to do uh, studies years ago that proved the universality of certain elements of uh, body language. And so, yeah, I, I was always fascinated by it. And it was, it was this fascination, actually, that led me to starting my business because yeah. there I was having studied loads of books on the topic. I, I then studied acting. I'd been teaching English overseas. And I found myself getting a haircut in London. And my hairdresser just said, oh, what are you uh, interested in, Richard? And I said, well, you know, I've got this real fascination with body language and I've been a teacher overseas and so on. And he said, wow, I, I love the concept of like learning more about body language. If I give you a free haircut today, would you come back and train some of my team? Because they don't seem to be very good at body language. And I said, well, look, I, I'm fascinated in it because I wasn't very good at it either. And he said, well, you know, you've studied acting. I'm sure you'll do a good job. Just, just, just come back and, uh, and do this next week and you'll train some of my hairdressers. And I, I shared with them what I knew at the time which took me maybe uh, 90 minutes to two hours. And they loved it. They thought it was amazing. And I thought, wow, I've actually, I've now started to study this enough that I've got more information than the average person. And they mm -hmm. said, come back and teach us again. And so I then was studying more books and getting more research and figuring out extra things and went back and trained them. And little did I realize this would happen, but they then the, the hair salon chain became a client of mine for the next 16 years. And oh, wow. the business built out of that that hair salon too, because I got a call after about a month from a client uh, who 
uh, someone who became a client, he said, I just had my hair cut today. And my hairdresser was saying that you're the country's greatest communication expert. And I'd love you to come and train my team of engineers. Could you make them good at body language? And I said, wow. well, maybe, maybe I could. And so I went and worked with them and they loved it. And, you know, one thing led to another. And now we've trained about 120,000 people. Uh, and it's all born out of that total fascination that I've always had uh, around body language. That is just an amazing story. I love that. And I think the interesting thing is, this is just about you personally, because I'm very, very curious about people, is that you learned a system, really, didn't you? It was mm. all about, OK, people, they do this and it means that. And then they do that and it means this. And maybe people who are more intuitive around uh, maybe don't have that um, sort of particular mental makeup let's just say that that you have they might pick up on all of that subconsciously but because mm. you didn't have that then you developed a system that is now very very helpful to other people which I think is really amazing really yeah. really fantastic and what a story yeah I think it's been it's been you know very beneficial for me if you like to have that uh, outside lens on communication uh, because you know I'll occasionally have clients who come to me and say um, you know I really want to have some presence I want to have charisma I want to have gravitas when I walk into a room how do you do that uh, and uh, from from having been an outsider it's it's something that I've been able to observe and sort of note down and get reference points for which the average neurotypical person would never need to think about because like you say they're just you know they are in the flow of communication they're never stopping to think well hang on a second that person just you know moved their arm and they they moved their head and that made an impact they've never had to do that whereas i've observed communication from the outside thinking how is it that that person is more interesting to them than the other person what is happening physically here that i can note down and and all of this led to you know i always wanted to make sure i gathered research and proved that it worked for people but i wanted to put this into um, a scientific study which we did a few years ago because i, I was keen to prove that what I thought was working for our clients was actually having an impact. And so we worked with the University College of London, uh, worked with Professor Adrian Furnham, who's one of the world's most revered uh, psychologists today. And he's published over a thousand papers uh, on uh, nonverbal influence and psychology in his uh, long standing career. And so we worked with him uh, to devise an experiment, which, you know, when I first met him, he, he sort of threw out my ideas and said, this is never going to work. It took us 18 months, essentially, to devise a study that to this day is one of the largest studies on nonverbal communication that we believe has ever been done. And we wanted to essentially find out, I said to him, I need to know, is there something that people can do that universally, no matter who they are and no matter who they're speaking to, can transform their impact, that it can make them appear more confident, more convincing, a better leader. It could win them greater votes in an election. And initially, we thought we probably couldn't figure it out, but eventually we did. And, you know, more than 2000 people from all over the world uh, took part in this study where we had people aged from 18 to 65 taking part, men and women uh, from from all over the place. And we we filmed a series of videos, essentially, where in these videos, everyone who was in this video, they said the same words and they wore the same clothes. But in yeah. the video, we had people who were older and younger, lighter skin, darker skin, just to see if any of those things made a difference. And first of all, we found out, which, which was a huge surprise, it didn't matter who the person was in the video. It didn't matter if they were male or female, older or younger, had lighter skin or darker skin. It didn't make an impact on the difference of you know, how people reacted to them. Because at the end of these videos, we said to people, rate them. Uh, and you know, How confident do you think that person is? Uh, how influential do you think they would be in business? Uh, and so on. And so we found it didn't matter who is in the video, but what did matter is that in these videos, they always wore the same clothes and they always uh, said the same words, but we just slightly changed their body language from one video to the next to see which one would have the most impact. And we essentially went from the most common habits that you see people using every day, and we shifted this across gradually to what we thought would be the most Im impactful style. And to our surprise, we were totally amazed by the results, particularly because uh, Professor Furnham had said initially, he said, you need to go into this study knowing you might prove nothing. In fact, you might prove that what you think is working does absolutely nothing and actually has a damaging effect. And we said, OK, that's OK. We'll go ahead with it. We don't mind. And so we went ahead and we found 
that by making a couple of shifts that we train clients on uh, that they can you know manage to navigate within the space of about half an hour that you can shift how many people would vote for you in an election by 58 percent a 58 percent increase and we also found that you, you could get 44 percent more people thinking that you're a good leader and you, you're wearing the same clothes, you're saying the same words, and suddenly you get this increase. And in terms of sales, for anybody interested in winning business, we found that we could get 42% more people convinced by what you had to say based on you saying the same words, wearing the same clothes, and just shifting your body language in a direction that proved more impactful. And it worked universally, which we were really delighted by. Gosh, I mean, that's really, really incredible. So, of course, by this point, everybody's going to be like, come on, spill the beans. What are those <laughs> things? What do I need to do in order to increase my impact and get all those fantastic results and get people seeing me as an authority and a leader? I mean, I want to know it. Yeah, I, of course <laughs> I do. Yeah. So come on then. Uh, what are yeah. you, What are the lessons? So, so I'll share a couple of pieces here and I'll just let people know as well. If they want to look up the study, I think it's about 20 pages long of lots of scientific statistics and so on. Um, that if they look up Richard Newman, Adrian Furnham, and I believe the paper was called Nonverbal Presence or Nonverbal Influence, uh, it was going back to about 2016, then they can find and download the whole thing. Uh, but for now, to give you some, some easy pieces uh, to take away. Firstly, what we found is that there's so many people when they're delivering a message, let's say that they are standing up to lead a team meeting do a sales pitch or speak at a conference, then uh, many people end up doing what we call the off-center shuffle, which is where they, they shift their weight from one hip to the next, leaning on one foot, one side, then leaning on the other foot, the other side. And uh, we wanted to test this in the study. And we found that when you do that kind of movement, if you're trying to look kind of casually, just leaning off to one side, you're seen as a pushover, which makes sense from the laws of physics. Because if you lean on one hip and someone pushes you, you fall over. You, oh. You're not in a position of uh, strength or gravitas. Whereas when we had people on these videos stand in a position where gravity is going straight down on the body uh -huh. and uh, you, you've slightly lifted up your sternum. So the sternum being the center of the chest plate here, if you'd slightly lift it, not too much because it looks arrogant and not, not dropping because it looks um, as if you're sort of disappointed. If you slightly lift it, you realign your posture and gravity is going straight down. Then if somebody gives you a push, then you, you don't move. You don't move as easily because gravity is now working with you, not against you. So you have gravitas. But uh -huh. there's a second piece that needs to go with this, which is the feet position. And this was one that I was fascinated by. And so we would video, and we do this over and over again, the exact same video, but just changing the position of the person's feet. And so it was a full length video that somebody could see. And so we tried this with feet together because this is very common. We see a lot of people standing feet together or sometimes feet slightly crossed over. We tried putting feet about shoulder width apart. Then we tried going sort of rock star style feet splayed apart as if you're sort of, you know, Madonna performing at a concert. And just to see well, what impact does that make? And we found that the least impactful position was having your feet together. Suddenly, when your feet are together, you look subservient. So there's nothing wrong with it. And importantly, there's nothing right or wrong with any element of body language. It's just a language, and it's useful in different situations. But the having feet together made someone look subservient, lacking confidence, less likely to win votes in an election, and so on. If you put your feet really wide apart, it looks ridiculous, and so therefore it damages your results. But if your feet are shoulder width apart for, for you, and you've got gravity going straight down in your body, suddenly you're in a really powerful position. And it's a position you can see sports people in over and over again. So if you watch your favorite sport, uh, let's say you like watching golf and someone's about to uh, you know, do the, the putt at the 18th hole, they stand with their feet shoulder width apart. They don't stand with their feet crossed. They don't splay them out too much. Shoulder width apart. If you're playing tennis and you're serving, uh, for uh, you know, serving for the win at Wimbledon, then you don't have your feet together. You don't have them crossed over. We want to make sure that they're apart, particularly actually if you're receiving serve, you're in a position where your knees are bent, feet shoulder width apart. You see it over and over again in sports. And it's something that you can bring into business. And we found it worked equally, equally well for men and women, whether you are wearing trousers or a skirt so people can fully see your legs or not. It, it, it 
it had that sort of power position uh, that allowed people to think, I believe in this person's words because they are truly centered and they have gravitas in that position. So that, that was one of the aspects that we looked at. And it's amazing when you get people to do this, where we coach clients so many times, they're stood up by a flip chart or a screen, they're going through the pitch that they're working on. And sometimes you're working with people on, you know, an individual pitch could be worth, you know, 600 million pounds. And we're trying to get it right for them. And when they're standing up there looking like a pushover, it's not going to help serve them well in that final situation. And when we shift them slightly and we say, okay, feet shoulder width apart, lift the sternum slightly. And then we start to work on the gestures and other aspects. Suddenly you can see that they engage the room because we're, we're like a tribe when we're watching someone. We want to see, are you the tribe leader? Are you going to be able to be the pack leader in this situation? Should we revere your words or not? And when you stand in that presence, and also when you sit in that way, whether you're on screen or, or sitting with people in person in a room, getting gravity on your side gives you a phenomenally improved impact. Uh, so that's sort of one of those pieces that is so easy to do. And it's such a quick win. And it makes sense with the laws of physics. And it can work for everybody. Amazing. Uh, that's just incredible. Uh, and uh, as you said, just the impact of that very simple idea is definitely worth remembering. OK, so I'm really interested to talk about hand movements because I've noticed mm. uh, that over the course of this video that you've been, you know, we only really see your upper body. You've been very animated. You've been very good in the way that you use your hands. Now I'm doing some YouTube stuff at the moment. I just started doing some, um, you know, new videos for that, and they're solo videos because obviously on the podcast I do a lot of interviews. So mm. I watch my videos back, and I think, do you know what? Yeah, the voice sounds fine. You know, it, my delivery is good, but I think I look a bit wooden because I'm not really using my hands in the right way. So then when I try to use my hands, I don't really know what to do with them. I don't know whether to do this or whether to do that or whether to do that or I just <laughs> don't know. So yeah. um, so I've been watching you and I've been thinking, I want what you've got. And obviously mm. for people that are listening, um, you, you know, on the podcast as opposed to watching our live stream, we're going to have to describe this in a way that makes them understand. But what are your tips, Richard? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's an area that I get asked about a lot as well, which I've started to find quite um, fun when people come on a workshop with me. And they'll often say to me, look, Richard, I've got this really important speech that's coming up, an important interview that's coming up, and I just don't know what to do with my hands. And the funny thing is, you know, you, you never see this problem come up when somebody goes to a, a party or goes out to a bar. They, they never sort of walk in to a situation thinking, uh, where do I put my hands? What do I do? We just, we just express ourselves. We talk about things. But then when we're on camera or when we're in an interview or when we're in a position where we're consciously aiming to make a, a good physical impact, we suddenly think, what do I do with these things to make them really work? What, what was I doing with them after I'd had a couple of cocktails and was telling that story about last year at a party last week? What, what, what was I doing? And so essentially what we need to do is we take what we're doing really well subconsciously in some situations and you make it conscious. Uh, and another couple of things for people to be aware of too is that there was some really good research that was done by uh, Susan Golden Meadow from University of Chicago. She did a series of experiments around gestures uh, that I found really intriguing. And one of them showed the importance of gesturing. And I, I say this to people, if anyone's listening and they've been told by their boss or they've been told by their parents at some point uh, to stop gesturing so much because it looks like silly hand waving. I find that a lot of clients, we have to free up their arms because somebody somewhere has said, oh, no, it's not professional to gesture. Keep your hands still. But actually, the U University of Chicago studies showed that uh, one of their studies, uh, they took some mathematicians and they took the people who were the least talented mathematicians in a class and they gave them a series of questions, oral questions. They had to express themselves out loud and they were told to gesture continuously as they were giving their answers. They then took the highest performing mathematicians and they gave them a series of questions. But they said, when you answer our questions, you have to sit on your hands. You're not allowed to move your hands at all. And what they found is that the previously lower scoring mathematicians were suddenly getting the best results and the previously higher scoring mathematicians were getting the worst results. Oh. But what they were starting to prove is there's so many nerve endings between your fingers and your brain that when you gesture as you speak, 
it speeds up your cognitive processing and you're able to, to give more intelligent and fluid answers. And so, you know, this is something that I always wish um, people going on to quiz shows would know about in advance because you often see this you know people go on a quiz show and they come away from it afterwards they say oh i would have known the answer if i was at home i would have known it and often we're watching it thinking i know the answer it's this and we're sort of gesturing at the screen and the person is sitting there in the hot seat on that quiz show and they're they're completely frozen solid thinking i don't know i don't know what the answer is and they physically frozen up their ability to stimulate their mind and, and get their ideas moving so it's important for you personally it's also important for the person listening to visually bring to life uh, your message and there's a few great ways that you can do this so i always say to people there's thousands of different gestures that you could use to express and describe different things but there's a few essential pieces so if you think about it a bit like playing tennis uh, in tennis, there's forehand, backhand, serve, and volley. And you need to know all of them in order to win the game. You, you can't show up not being able to know how to serve. You've got to know what those things are. Then there's lots of other things you can do in your style, but you must know forehand, backhand, and so on. So the same goes with gesturing. So the simplest ones to talk about, and actually to go back to the study I talked about earlier on that we did with Professor Furnham and his team, we studied gesturing there to see what impact they would have on an audience. And most notably, we found that if you do no gestures or if you do low gestures, by which I mean sort of down by your side, below your waist, or if you're in a meeting room below the table, if you are in a virtual meeting out of shot, if you're gesturing there, you get much lower ratings. People think you are less confident. You're not such a good leader suddenly. So you have to make sure that you have elevated uh, those gestures. And so when, when you're on screen, you've got to make sure that you're sort of you're gesturing in shot. And I'm always making sure that I say to people, frame yourself so that you're not just sort of cut off at the chin, as many people are, or just cut off at the shoulders. You need to be able to get your hands into shot. And then the ones that we found were most effective in this study, first of all, is doing uh, palms up. So palms up, if you just imagine, if you're listening to this, just imagine that you've got your hands in front of you, palms up as if you were going to sort of put something into them to carry it. Uh -huh. And importantly, your hands need to be between shoulder and waist height. That's the most effective height. If you go above your shoulders, then suddenly it looks like you're getting a bit too dramatic. And if you go below your waist, it looks a bit deflated. So you want to be between the shoulders and the waist and slightly away from your body. Because if you gesture, and I see too many people doing this, gesturing with their elbows against their body, then they look a little bit like they've sort of got T-Rex hands and it's just not very effective for making an impact. So you want to make sure you've got a couple of fists distance between your elbow and the side of your body, which starts to give you physical presence. Now, now palms up, importantly, what this means uh, is it's universally seen as an open gesture. And you can use this anywhere. I've tried you know, using these gestures, haggling for souvenirs on the streets of India and Morocco and going out to South Korea for one job and in Australia. People understand these gestures, whether they understand your lang language or not. So palms up is open. It's an open gesture that you might use to say, welcome everybody, great to see you here. And really importantly, and this is the one, if people remember this, this is the most important thing. If you're asking questions, if you're, especially if you're leading a virtual meeting and you're asking questions, you need to do palms up. Because when you do a palm up, people visually see that you are asking for them to participate. And this is one of the challenges people have with virtual meetings is they ask a question, but there's no visual signal. And they, they can't, you know, the, the audience listening can't see any palms up. So they're thinking, was that a rhetorical question? Am I supposed to be engaged here? Because if you're in the room with them and you did palms up, They'd know, oh, you want me to participate in the conversation. So doing palms up is critical to get people to give you information, to open up, to get the flow of the conversation going. The opposite would be palms down. And this one is critical to get right. So I'll describe for people who are only listening. You want to imagine that you have in front of you, <laughs> the easiest way to imagine this, and it sounds funny to say it, imagine that you have two small children in front of you, you've placed your hands on their heads, and you're gently trying to push them into the ground. That's the sort of position that we're going into. So it's like a push gesture. So importantly, your, your wrist is slightly angled so that your fingers are slightly higher than the wrist. So it's in sort of this sort of position. You don't want to be in this position where uh, the, the, the wrist is bent so the fingers are pointing towards the floor. Instead, the fingers are just slightly up as if you're pushing something away from you. And palms down is for a closed message. And again, this is where it's useful if you're negotiating or haggling with people in uh, where you don't have you know, English 
uh, shared between you or shared language. You can use palms down when you say, this is my final offer. Yeah, this is uh, my we final. have to get this finished. That's mm -hmm. it. So you can sort of say, by four o'clock on Friday, I need this on my desk. Palms down. And people go, okay, he means it. And what's funny about this, wow. I, was training, I was training a telecommunications company in Ireland uh, going back, I'm going to say maybe 10 years ago. We did a three-day negotiation skills course for them and they were negotiating on contracts worth millions and after this three days of training we went away we came back i think six months later for a booster session and this guy came up to me and he said palms down saved me and i said what did you mean what do you mean by this he said well you remember how we were working on this particular contract and this lady was really challenging and she was always pushing me down on price and so on i said yeah and he said well i tried all the other strategies that you gave us on this communication course and nothing was working. And finally, I just turned to her with two palms down and I said, that's my final offer. And she said, fine, shook my hand and we got the deal. Wow. Uh, so you know, visually people really understand it. But, but unfortunately, I've seen this too many times where people are speaking, say, you might see a leader doing this if they're speaking in a team meeting or a conference or so on. Very often you see them doing palms down and they'll say, does anyone have any questions? Do you have any questions here? Anything you want to share with me? And the, the whole room is silent because they're visually giving the gesture of don't speak. I, I'm, I'm oh. giving you the final word on this. Don't speak. So you've got to make sure that you do palms up when you want people to engage with you. Palms down when the engagement is over or you're doing a, a message that is, is a closed definitive statement. Fantastic. Honestly, it's just amazing. Okay. I like, I'm really hungry for more tips now, uh, Richard. So okay. we've got palms up, palms down. Now, any others? Yeah. So I'll tell you one of my favorite ones that uh, when, when we teach this to people, uh, we, you know, we might be doing this on say like a two day workshop. We save it for day two because we know how, how it's going to blow people's minds a little bit because it's so simple, but yet so rarely used. And this is timeline gestures, timeline gestures. Right. And so what this means, uh, very simply, no matter where you go uh, around the world, the vast majority of people, they see time such that you see the past on your left and you see the future on your right. What I mean by that is just imagine, if you're listening to this, uh, imagine that you look at a graph. A graph is up on a screen in front mm -hmm. of you. And along the bottom line on that graph, zero is on one side and 100 is on the other side. Which side is the zero one. Well, we'd see zero on our left and we'd see uh, 100 on our right. Definitely. And so that's how we see time going. Also, if there was a graph that had January on one side and December on the other side, and we're looking at the statistics for last year and so on, then we see January on the left and we see December on the right. So here's the challenge. We see time moving from left to right. But as I'm speaking to you now, my left is over here and my right is over here. And so when I'm speaking to other people, I have to make sure that I do things the other way around. So oh. I would move from this side, which is my right, across to this side, which is my left, if I want to right. move correctly through time. So essentially, when you're gesturing, and this is great when you get it right, you oh. gesture past, present, and future. So for anybody listening, your past, when you gesture and talk about the past, move to your right. Move to your right. So you say, in the past, such and such happened. And people think, ah, oh, okay, yeah. Then you say, in the middle, you say, today, this is what we're dealing with in our business. And you do that in the middle. Then you move to your left and you say, let me now talk about the future. And when you do that, your gestures have been so congruent with the timeline of what you're saying. It's utterly charismatic for people. They think, wow, this person really knows what they're doing. They've got certainty. They've got assurance behind what they're doing. Timeline gesturing. The other piece you can do with that, which is great for influence, is that every time you mention something that's negative, you talk about it being in the past, which is with your right hand. If you talk about things that are positive, you talk about them with your left hand, which is in the future, because everyone in business wants to move away from a negative past towards a positive future. And so if you're gesturing that way, then you can compel people to listen and convince them also that challenges are going to be behind you, greater days are going to be in front of you, and you can lead people more effectively towards the end of that meeting thinking, I'm now feeling superb, I'm feeling upbeat, I'm going to leave this meeting and go and get great things done because you've given them that timeline satisfaction with your gestures.
Wow. And of course, uh, this is so important in sales because sales is always about a transformation, right? So, you know, we're mm. taking people away from something that they don't want towards something that they do. So this is absolutely integral, I would have thought, in terms of any presentation. So that's really important to remember. So we talk about the past using our right hand and the future. Yes. So that's kind of easy to remember. Yeah. Yeah. And in case people sort of struggle to remember in future, I always think uh, right is wrong. So your right hand is for negative things. Right is wrong. Right left is, wrong. is uh, about the future. Yeah. Oh, that's a really amazing. OK. Any more, Richard? Uh, so so a few other things that people can think about with uh, with body language. Firstly, I, I developed this system where I, I talk people through six major elements that are critical to transform your impact around uh, your, your physicality, which is around posture, legs, arms, tension, eyes, and smiling or facial expressions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody once said to me, I know, Richard, you've got six categories that you've developed here, but which one's most important? And I said, which one's most important? They're all really important. But I said, actually, probably tension can be a critical one to get right. And it's often uh, something that people don't really think about in their body language. Now, why is this important? So uh, from the elements that I've talked about so far with posture and your gestures, you could be in a position where you've set yourself up really well to go into that next uh, next meeting, interview, sales pitch, to have a really nice centered body language, lifted sternum, you're grounded in your feet, you've got palms up and palms down. But suddenly, if there's a little bit too much tension in what you're doing, it can look too aggressive. But equally, if you don't have enough tension, in there, then it just looks a bit flat as if you don't really care. And the challenge also is that it comes through your voice. So even if people are just listening to this, you would have known the type of gesture I was doing in those last few sentences, whether you could see me or not. Because physically, when you change what you're doing with your arms, you change the tension that's coming through in your voice and the emphaticness that's happening. And so you've got to think about how do I want the other person I'm speaking to to feel? What is the feeling I'm going towards? And therefore, what level of tension do I need in order to generate that feeling? And so uh, I've sometimes been coaching people who they are, you know, they're, they're going into a meeting where things are a bit tense, a bit challenging in, in their, their business, and they just want to go and reassure people. They need to reassure their team. They need to reassure their clients. But the challenge being they're feeling tense. And so if they go into that meeting to reassure people and they've got tension in their body, they say, OK, the thing is, everybody, everything's fine. OK, we just need to relax. You need to calm down <laughs> because everything's going to be all right. And they're saying the right words. They might be even doing the right gestures. But the challenge is there's too much tension there. And I'm exaggerating, obviously, but people pick up on it. And they'll pick up on it as well as everything else you're doing in your body language. And they'll think, is this congruent? Is the tension congruent with the message? And if it isn't, it doesn't work. So we sometimes coach people around this to say, if you want your voice to sound reassuring, then you need to change your gestures. So rather than thinking about lots of work and breathing that you could do and sirening with the voice and so on, just think about changing your gestures. And so I coach people sometimes if they want to do reassuring gestures, I say to them, imagine you've got two large dogs either side of you with beautiful coats of hair, and you're going to just stroke them as you speak to people. And if you stroke those two large, beautiful dogs, oh. you can say, look, everything's going to be fine. We've got a great year ahead of us. You can yeah. all just kind of take it easy. And a fun story around this is that <laughs> helped me win a, a sales it. pitch. I was working with a pharmaceutical company where uh, they had a team in the UK we trained and their head of the head of Australia came over and he saw what we were doing. And he said, wow, I need this for my team. Can you pitch to me, Richard? Now, he was a very relaxed Australian. And so I tried pitching and I am um, if I'm not thinking about it, I'm relatively high intensity. And so I gave him this pitch about, yeah, it'd be fantastic. We'll come out there. We'll train your team. And he was very sort of laid back Australian and he wasn't really getting my vibe, getting my energy. And uh, in the end, it turned out we, we didn't we didn't win the pitch. And he called me a year later and he said, look, Richard, I need you to pitch to me again. The thing is, we've tried three different companies in Australia to match what you do and none of them can do it. Pitch to me again. So I said to him, OK, uh, and, I, and I set up a time that we would do the pitch, which was 11 p.m. UK time, uh, which would be then morning in Australia. So I thought he's going to be feeling alert. I'm going to be feeling sleepy. 
And I did this by voice. So it was before sort of doing video calls. And I just sat back and I was nearly asleep at 11 p.m. I was in my pajamas, put my feet up on my desk. And I was, as I was speaking to him, I was just imagining I was stroking these two large dogs to give him this sales pitch and make it feel easy breezy. And by the end of it, he was saying, oh, Richard, you feel like you're absolutely on our wavelength. You're the kind of guy we want. We're going to give you the deal. And then they flew us first class out to Australia. And it was just about me thinking about how much tension do I need in my voice to make sure that he feels the way I need him to feel about this. So you've got to make sure you're thinking about that part of your body language. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I was just reminded reminded of when I first entered the career in sales. And I remember one of the first things that they said is, when you talk to a prospect on the phone, you've got to smile. And I always remember like, okay, when I'm when I'm really uh, want to close somebody, I always smile. I always smile because people's voice sounds different, different when they smile, don't they? You can always tell yeah. if you've got somebody on the end of the phone and they're actually smiling and they're looking as though they're you feel as though you enjoy it as well when you smile. It's kind of amazing mm. how it's a, a chicken and egg thing, isn't it? That sometimes yeah. you can, it, it doesn't always have to start with the mind. Sometimes it does start with the body, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you look at footage of voiceover actors, uh, then you can see this little insight into how much physicality they're putting behind uh, the voice. I, I love looking at clips of, say, Tom Hanks, who's famous for doing yeah. the voice of Woody in Toy Story. And yeah, yeah. I think it was around Toy Story 3, they did a behind the scenes documentary because yeah. he was keen to show everybody how hard you have to work when nobody is ever going to see the effort that they are making behind the microphones. Amazing. And he's there going, Rah! like being Woody, getting really frustrated. There's all this <laughs> physical expression, the gestures going, like the eyebrows coming together. And he says he has to do that because if he doesn't do it, then people will notice in the voice. You can't just show up in the uh, the recording booth and just drink your coffee and say the words. You have to physically do it to get that feeling to come through the microphone. Oh, that's just, you know, it's just such a fantastic topic. And I just really want to thank you, Richard, for coming on the show tonight. It's been so amazing to have you here. And thank you so much for all of those amazing lessons. I tell you what, I feel as though I've had a masterclass in nonverbal communication. <laughs> I'm going to go out there and smash it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so now, Richard, you've, you've just written a book, haven't you? And um, so tell us about your book show us your book and what yeah, inspired really you to write one. it yeah lift your impact yeah, beautiful so, cover thank you so much yeah, i'm really pleased with this it's uh, published by mcgraw hill and lift yeah. your impact essentially i put this together this has been you know many many years in the making but i put it together now especially just sort of post pandemic because i've noticed that so many clients are really struggling with three things that yeah. i didn't notice as much before the pandemic so firstly people have been really struggling with mindset people feeling stressed, uh, anxious, overwhelmed, not mm -hmm. sure which way to go, not sure you know, how to make decisions anymore because of everything that's happening with burnout and so on. So I wanted to help people with mindsets. Yes. Secondly, people want to have deeper connections than they've had before because now that we are working remotely much more so, and often you know, many people on teams have been hired remotely and never even met their teams, even yeah. when they are going into an office and some companies now are forcing people back into the office two or three days per week, they then feel like they don't really have a connection with the other people. They're not rubbing shoulders with them every day. And so they've got these surface level relationships and people want deeper connections. So the second main piece of the book is around deeper connections. And the third piece I wanted to put in there, because I really care about it as a business owner and entrepreneur and working with leaders, is all around goal setting and how do you keep momentum long enough doing the right things that can elevate your future and the future of everybody around you. And so I put all of these together in this book and it's very much a workbook with workbook pages you can write on and take part in it so you can get uh, so much from this. So uh, yeah, I was really pleased to create this and there's a hardback audio book, ebook, the whole thing so that people can share this with their teams. Wow. Well, that looks absolutely amazing. Well, Thank you again, Richard, for coming on. And if our viewers or listeners want to contact you, what's the best way to get hold of you? Yeah, so the best place to go is if you go to liftyourimpact.com forward slash the book, you can find out more information about me and talks that I give at, speak, uh, at uh, conferences and social media links on there as well. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Richard Newman Body Talk, and you can find me on Instagram at Richard Newman Speaks. 
Okay. Well, thank you again, Richard. It's been so great. I really appreciate you coming on the Smart Connector podcast and look forward to seeing you again soon, I hope. Great. Thanks, Jane. Appreciate it.